Welcome to Fridays with Fintelect. My guest today is Alia Mahmood, who specializes in global regulatory affairs at Comply Advantage based in the UK. Alia was earlier head of compliance at Algebra, which is an e-money services provider. And before that, she was with Revolute, Oak North, and the Qatar National Bank Group. Uh, Alia, welcome to Fridays with Fintelect. And to start with, can you give us an overview about your personal journey in the world of AML CFT and how the various career moves you had have shaped and impacted you to get you into the position you are in today. Thank you, Sharesh, and thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be joining you and speaking to your audience. I've always been interested in criminal law, and my interest actually developed when I was studying law as part of my undergraduate. I was inspired by my criminal law professor. She was a formidable woman, and she actually told me at that time, which I found quite odd, that I had a sense of being able to identify people's motives, what one would call the mens rea in, in criminal law, what, what their mental state was at that time. And she encouraged me to pursue a career in criminal law, which is what I did before before I got into compliance. But I quickly learned that representing the underbelly of society for heinous crimes was something that conflicted with me internally and my values. Uh, but I was still interested in white collar crime, but it was a question of, well, how do I pursue that as a career choice? Um, I, I knew I needed to get into financial services and banking and to get my foot in the door, I joined Lloyds Bank here in the UK as a risk analyst. And that was very interesting because I was analyzing large amounts of data to identify fraudulent transactions. And that was really when I kind of picked up on the analytical skills you need to be successful in the compliance field. But it was still a struggle to move up the organization because what I constantly heard was that I don't have enough experience in financial services or in banking. At that time, compliance wasn't really, um, it wasn't offered as a degree and a certification as widely as it is being offered today. But the university where I did my postgraduate law degree to train as a solicitor had introduced a new master's program in financial regulation and compliance. So I was very keen on, you know, jumping on that understanding and really drilling down into the academic area of financial regulation and compliance. It also allowed me to get a job at HSBC, where I joined as a risk analyst again. And I spent the most of my career at HSBC, spending six years there. And the benefits you have of working in an institution like HSBC is that you can move into different business functions and understand different products and services and really get under the hood of what are the risks of specific products and services and what are the best practices. It was also the time when HSBC was under fire for the Mexican drug cartel money laundering. So within the organization itself, there was a strong compliance culture and tone from the top, which meant that we really needed to embed those best practices. I, I believe in everyone's career, having good managers is a blessing. It's a blessing because they can mentor you and really give you that constructive feedback you need early on in your career. And I was able to get that from all the managers I worked with at HSBC. And it helped me build confidence in not only myself, but also in my acumen in the area. So Post HSBC, I wanted to move into a more high risk industry, which in the United Kingdom, it's the world of foreign banking. It's the world of, you know, high net worth individuals bringing large sums of money into the United Kingdom, taking out large sums of money in cash and trade finance. And that's when I moved into Qatar National Bank as a deputy MLRO. And it was it was pushing me out of my comfort zone because at HSBC, I was just a manager. Um, I had a very small team, but I wasn't responsible responsible for actually identifying and mitigating risks in, in the business. So it taught me a lot about collaborating with people, explaining to foreign jurisdictions what the UK standards were, and also working with our teams um, abroad on how to do transaction monitoring and customer screening and what those best practices were. A lot of the analysts being based in India, um, and then also in Qatar itself. Qatar National Bank it again, has that traditional banking model. So legacy technology and legacy technology can become very frustrating for a compliance professional. And that's when I knew I had to move into the fintech space because for me at that time, it was the future and it's, you know, it is the, the way banking is moving. So Revolut uh, was a light bulb moment for me because working in a tech company, you could just see all of the opportunities of innovative financial products, having that mobile banking and that control of finance 
finances at your fingertips was a new world for me as a compliance professional. And then that came with its own challenges because with the, you know, arrival of real-time payments, you know, instant payments through mobile apps and all these new innovative products to help you control your money, risks increase. And then identify identifying those risks and implementing compliance processes was very interesting. But my focus at Revolut was not financial crime. It was regulatory compliance, what we used to call internally at Revolut as employee conduct. So areas around conflicts of interest, bribery and corruption, whistleblowing, and establishing those processes internally. And th th those type of areas of regulatory compliance have a special kind of tension because you're dealing with individuals within the organization itself and you're wanting those individuals to do things the right way themselves proactively by reporting gifts and entertainment, reporting their conflicts of interest, or reporting concerns through the whistleblowing channels. Um, Revolut was great. I was there for three, almost three years. Uh, but then what I really wanted to do was get, the, get exposure to starting, um, joining a startup and from grassroots building it up, building out those mm -hmm. compliance processes and getting authorizations and licensing from the, the regulator, an area that you don't often get a chance to be in. So when the algebra opportunity came up as an ethical fintech, it really appealed to me because fintech, again, can be used as a source of good to help your societies, your communities, and to increase financial inclusion. It was we were very fortunate that we got regulated within a few months. So for, from my perspective, my job there was done. The regular kind of MLRO role wasn't of interest to me at that point because I wanted to have a wider impact in terms of the products and solutions companies use to actually identify their risks and mitigate those risks, because that is where the power really is. It's in the technology, the vendors you work with, and being able to build that out. And having worked in the compliance space myself for more than 12, 13 years now, I knew that I would have that knowledge that could help um, a technology company to build out those products and to strategize, which is what got me at Comply Advantage where I am today. Fantastic, fantastic. That's a uh... Uh, really nice uh, progression and you know uh, sort of wide-ranging journey and uh, I hope your professor uh, watches this episode and so so do some of your mentors. So, I hope so. <laughs> uh, so Adia, you uh, you know sort of uh, have been interacting with compliance leaders from around the world uh, in the past and uh, you do so now as well. Uh, what would you say are some of the challenges that keep them awake at night currently? Okay, so I'm going to be a bit provocative with this question, because okay. um, I, I think we all know what the, the main challenges are that are keeping compliance professionals up at night. It's, you know, the ever evolving regulatory landscape, sanctions regimes, managing that those real time payments and the vast amount of data that that produces. Um, but I think what's really keeping compliance leaders up at night, which is not often talked about, is number one, poor governance. The risk that despite the amazing policies and procedures you have in place on paper, people will not be following those. And a robust governance framework is vital in order to make sure business decisions are being made um, with risks in mind, whether that be your financial crime risks, your regulatory risks, or even data protection and legal risks. Um, so poor governance is certainly keeping compliance professionals up at night. And we've seen that within our state of financial crime report, the, the report that Comply Advantage issued earlier this year, where 45% of our respondents who comprised of 800 C-suite executives said that the one area that was most at risk at it, in an audit was the um, effectiveness of their policies and procedures. So again, you can have amazing documents, but people need to follow that. The second um, area I believe that's keeping compliance leaders up at night is the, the, the need for an independent second line of defense. So as part of the risk management framework, we have that concept of the three lines of defense where the business is the first and the second is your risk and compliance and the third line is your audit. And in order to effectively be able to challenge business decisions and be able to help the company strategize its compliance framework, you need to have an independent second line of defense. And I feel oftentimes those lines can become blurred or the second line is not independent enough to have that oversight that it should have. Excellent. Right. Um, I think very, very relevant challenges that you've uh, brought up. 
Now, uh, I think you also write quite a bit on LinkedIn and you had a post uh, in the recent past called Musings of a Compliance Manager in which you had written about uh, laundering in the metaverse. Uh, so just to get into that subject, I mean, can you explain how this happens and what should banks and financial institutions do uh, to safeguard themselves as well as their customers from this risk? Yeah, the metaverse is is very exciting. There's this concept of a virtual world and being able to have a virtual persona and avatar in this virtual world. And although it's opening up opportunities for legitimate companies to sell goods and services in virtual worlds, it's also going to be exploited by criminals because as more of us move into the metaverse, so will criminals. And I believe that's why Interpol opened up its first headquarters in the metaverse last year and are working with tech companies to get ahead of the financial crimes that they're seeing. Now, essentially, the metaverse uh, and the goods and services that you can use to launder illicit um, funds to the metaverse is very similar to how you can do it in the real world. So that is through the use of virtual real estate, virtual luxury goods, uh, NFT digital artworks. And it's a great place for criminals to actually place and leave um, illicit funds for a while before they need to kind of integrate it back into fiat currency. And for them, they can simultaneously launder money in the real world and in the virtual world. So, you know, the, the vast amount of money that could be laundered is, is scary to think about. From our financial um, state of financial crime survey, 91% of respondents said that they've seen an increased use in decentralized finance. So that, that is where the trend is going. And 60% of firms said that they're looking at obtaining their own crypto licenses and virtual asset service provider licenses as opposed to partnering, which means that they really need to understand what is the regulatory framework around virtual worlds and virtual assets. And we've seen some very good regulatory regimes come about in, uh, in terms of VARA and, and the, the comprehensive regulations that VARA provides. And we've also seen, uh, we're also going to see Mika come out in Europe. So the markets in crypto assets regulation. And all of these can be used by companies that are not regulated today to arm themselves and get their house in order for when they do become regulated and fall under that regulatory regime. Because it's it's not it's a matter of when that will happen, not if it will happen. Um, and FATF itself has released really good standards on virtual asset service providers. But the virtual world itself needs a regulatory regime, not just the assets that can be used in it. And I think right now regulators are talking about the risks um, and the pros of digital assets. Even in um, India, the, the, the Reserve Bank of India in their 2020 and 2021 report on finance and currency are talking about what are the risks with central bank digital currencies. Similarly in Europe, the European Parliament are talking about the potential for a digital euro. And how would that virtual world be regulated? But not enough is being done at the moment. Well, not enough output is being seen at the moment. I'm sure work is being done in the background. And I think traction will only start to develop when we see central banks start to issue and inject central bank digital currencies within the virtual world, because they will have an agenda, a personal agenda to protect those assets. Right. Uh, so earlier, let's speak a bit about ESG, because I think that's also an area of uh, personal interest for you. Now, you know, with ESG getting more and more attention from corporates, uh, are you seeing the occurrence of ESG-related illicit activity? And if so, uh, what would you say is the significance of this to the AML compliance community in terms of understanding or detecting or reporting some suspicious activity? And are there any synergies between AML and ESG that can be used to advantage by financial institutions? Yes, absolutely. We have seen an increase in ESG related crimes. Uh, from our report, 59% of our respondents said that they have seen an increase in financial crimes in these areas. And 99% of firms are actually saying that they're reevaluating their risk appetite to, to combat the risks that they're facing. Environmental crime is the one of the most destructive, lucrative, and fastest growing financial crimes because it is a cross-cutting transnational 
crime that is taking place by organized crime groups. And the more conflicts we see in the world, whether that be political or through natural disasters, the more criminals will exploit that environment in order to smuggle, exploit, um, and traffic endangered species, minerals that are scarce, you know, and even um, metals that are becoming scarce that we need for energy. But I want to break down the components of ESG and, and then take each per turn. So we've talked about environmental crime. Um, it is it, it has been estimated that it, it generates 110 to 280 billion US dollars a year in illicit funds. And that's a huge, significant amount of money. Um, and it's very important for AML professionals to understand how environmental crime can converge into other types of financial crimes, such as bribery and corruption, human trafficking is often seen, and then of course money laundering, because environmental crime is a predicate offense to money laundering. Now if we look at social, the, so, the, the S in the ESG, I, I actually came across a term that um, has stuck with me in one of Europol's reports, and it's a, called people as a commodity. So the concept that there's so many different types of crimes that can be inflicted against a human being to use them as a commodity. And we've seen that through child exploitation, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, migrant smuggling, bonded labor. And it, it, it's scary because these are people just like you and I, the difference being that they're in vulnerable situations or that they've been displaced. And there's so many opportunities happening for criminals to exploit these people, whether it's wars that are causing migrants to have to cross into other borders or even natural disasters, which are leaving hundreds and thousands of children orphaned and without someone to look after them. The, the, the important thing for AML professionals is to get not just into the mind of a criminal to understand, well, how will they go about actually laundering all this money um, that's coming through from these criminal activities, but also what are the specific indicators related to the types of customers you bank with? So the different, if, you, if it's business banking, the, the operations of that business, where they're based, so the country risk factor, and then also looking at transactional trends that might un, um, identify typologies. So oftentimes we see um, transactions, which are repeated transactions with specific types of merchants, which do not seem to have a legitimate reason behind it. For example, merchants that are dealing with land and air travel, cheap lodging facilities, you know, th th that's a risk indicator that needs to be included within your transaction monitoring scenarios. And you can do this through the use of machine learning and algorithms that are built in, um, similar to how um, Comply Advantage provides these type of new detectors to customers. In addition to that, specific types of businesses like the construction industry, beauty, massage in in industry work, very high cash intensive businesses, uh, the extraction and exploration of precious metals and minerals. Those are all business types that are higher risk for these types of people as a offenses. And, and it's very important for AML professionals to ensure that they're not just using standard high velocity in, high velocity out, high volume in, high volume out transaction monitoring rules, but actually target what are the indicators. Um, and to round it off, governance. Governance, I feel, is the most important factor within ESG, because like I said earlier, without a robust governance framework, you cannot assure that your business decisions are being made with the environment and the society in mind. So it's very important that institutions, in order to effectively discharge their role as private gatekeepers to prevent the facilitation of money laundering, ensure that all of their AML policies and procedures are effective and are being followed through monitoring and testing, quality assurance, and then of course, audit that can highlight gaps in processes. Right, right, interesting. So Alia, let's speak a bit about uh, quality of reporting because I think that is something which is uh, you know high on the agenda of most of the FIUs that we speak to. Uh, and because of that uh, emphasis, you know, are you seeing uh, any innovative ways in which technology is adding value to health banks or other financial institutions or any regulated entities to overcome this challenge of uh, making sure that the reports that are submitted uh, are indeed of high quality. 
Yes, indeed. I think this is where regulatory technology plays a key role in being able to automate those reports, but also automate the data collection, data cleansing, ensuring that that data is accurate. And I've seen this type of regulatory technology be used not only for financial reporting, but also for the financial crime reporting that institutions need to be need to do. So, for example, your annual money laundering reports or your fin crime reports to regulators. Um, it's a very time consuming and manual task to obtain this data. Um, and lots of institutions have legacy systems that are not connected. So you're, you're having to move into different systems to collate that data. And that gives rise to naturally human errors that can occur. And you don't want to report anything in error to the regulator because, you know, once you're under their radar, <laughs> you know, it's, they're going to get under the hood and investigate everything. So, Financial institutions should really look at bringing in reg tech, no, regulatory technology, partnering with vendors in the space, whether it be their financial reports or their financial crime reports, in order to automate everything. It frees up their own internal resources so they can focus on more important matters, but it also removes the need of having to build something in-house, which you might not build correctly. Right. So earlier, uh, you know, when you spoke earlier, you mentioned uh, some statistics from uh, a report that Compliant Advantage published, and I'm guessing that's the report that has highlighted trends that will shape the compliance industry in 2023. So to end, can you share with us some of the key findings of this particular report? Yes, absolutely. I, I urge all of you um, who are listening to actually download a free copy of the report from the Comply Advantage website. It's very insightful and can really help you strategize your compliance program for the year. Some of the interesting statistics we've seen, I spoke about them before, where like 99% of firms are talking about de-risking or re-evaluating their risk appetite. But we've also seen a trend in the need for more compliance professionals. So we've had a 69% um, respondents tell us that they're looking at increasing their compliance staff with um, resources constrained, of course, because of the economic downfall. Some of these staff could be hired from jurisdictions outside of the UK. So great opportunities for people abroad, specific, especially in India as well, to actually join a company in the UK and help them with their financial crime fighting because there are huge amounts of analytical skills in, in, in that country. We've also seen a third of organizations focus on reputational risk. So reputational risk having the impact on not only your ability to scale and enter new jurisdictions, but also the impact it could have on funding and investor confidence in your company. And reputational risk, again, is one of those risks that wasn't at the focal point until regulators started talking about good conduct, good culture, and seeing adverse media really impact companies progress is, is why firms are looking at reputational risk. Um, we've also seen um, an in, in, in increase in supply chain management, so supply chain risk management and third-party due diligence, where 45% of firms said that that is a challenge for 2023 for them. So again, the regulators focusing on the outsourcing of critical services to third parties, overseas third parties, cross-border sharing of information, and the importance of ensuring that not only do you know who your customers are, you need to know who your third parties are and have reassurance in their control processes. Um, but one of the ones um, that really kind of um, surprised me was where we asked, let me just find that statistic one second. We had 38% of firms tell us that regulatory enforcement actions would be a driver for them to actually reevaluate their compliance programs. And I thought that number would be much higher because I thought, you know, a regulatory enforcement action is kind of the slap on the wrist or the kind of push you need to get things in order. But only 38% of respondents came back to tell us that. And a whole lot of other very interesting statistics in the report. Great. So, Alia, thank you so much for sharing all your insights, uh, your personal insights, as well as those from the report. It was lovely speaking with you and uh, all the best uh, to you for the future. Thank you so much, Sharish. It was a pleasure speaking with you also and your audience.